I want you to turn in your Bibles with me for just a few minutes to Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. 16, 1 and 2, book of Romans. Paul is giving closing uh, exhortations there. You find that if you'd stand with me, and if you don't have a Bible with you, we'll put it on the screen, the text on the screen for you so you can see it. If you need a Bible, see me afterwards and we can get one in your hand. I told you for years now, I much prefer for you to gaze on your copy of the Scriptures to see that what I'm telling you is coming from the Scriptures. We're thinking today about the question, we asked the question last week, what is a deacon? And, and I thought we would be able to tie together this Mother's Day celebration with the question, what is a deaconess? And if the question be asked, what, what would I want you to know when we leave her? I, I want you to know that being a wife and a mother uniquely qualifies a woman to develop the attitudes and attributes reflected in the title deaconess that we're going to unpack. I want you to feel, particularly you ladies, the goodness of God to place you in the crucible of biblical womanhood, whereby you develop as a suitable helper with a servant heart, which is my definition, short definition of what is a deaconess. We said last week that a deacon is a servant leader who follows Christ in order to lead more effectively. And I hope in the light of this that you will embrace your calling and continue to flourish as a deaconess in your home, in this church and the community at large. Let's look at the text. Romans 16, 1 and 2, Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself. If you notice, uh, I had the word diakonon. I put that in. That's the word servant there. That's what Paul calls her. A patron of many and of myself as well. What have we just read together here? We've read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Let's embrace it today and let it, let it grab hold of us that we may understand better the Lord's call uh, to the ministry of his churches. Thank you. Be seated. The question has been asked, where did women fit into the ministry of the early church? And you read the New Testament, read Paul's letters, you see that he includes references to women. Uh, and the way that he does so is, if, you, if, you're, if you're keenly aware, it's striking compared to the, to the place of women in that culture. In the culture of the first century, women were, were ill-treated. They were lightly regarded. In some, some places, uh, looked upon as, as barely any, any better than house pets. But Paul and Jesus before him commends women. Talks about women in the ministry. What he, what he just said here of Phoebe is a striking contrast. He commends Phoebe in this passage we just read for her service in the church at Sincrea. And he uses the word deacon. It's interesting. There's, there's no feminine form of that in the Greek language. So when he talks about her as a servant, it's the, it's the male form diakonos or diakonon in that, in that setting. He praises her as a helper. The word there we're going to see in a minute, is, it speaks of leadership. It, it's patron in the, in the ESV leadership qualities of, of helping effectively. Some biblical scholars um, discuss this and develop, uh, say that the early New Testament developed a, a role of deaconess. Others say, no, it's just uh, it's a non-technical use by Paul. But whatever, wherever one lands on that, it's clear that the passage we read earlier, Mark 10, 35 to 45, particularly verse 45, that the heart, the best heart of a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a servant heart. 
And I believe that God puts women in the crucible of life in a way that uniquely prepares them and equips them so that you know some churches that really it's the servant heart of the women that, that drives the pulse of that church. We bless God that here we have men with servant hearts, but, but oh, what a great compliment and encouragement are the women with servant hearts here. And you, when you think about it, and we'll develop this, in the New Testament, as the early church was, was burgeoning, there were needs there. Yes, the deacons, the first deacons who were appointed by the church in Jerusalem to make sure that the meals were being distributed evenly between the, the Jewish converts to Christianity and the Hellenists, the Greek converts to Christianity. Yes, they could do that, but they could not go into the sick room. Of, it would be inappropriate to go into certain places and minister at certain levels with the women of that congregation. When you look at this matter historically, you find that... Uh, that women called deaconesses are mentioned in the third century documents as taking care of, of female converts in preparation for, for baptism. Visiting women, as I said, in their sick beds, instructing them as Paul, as P Paul talks about to Titus. When you consider further in the first century that, that the rigid separation between the sexes, so much so that in, in Jewish cultures, the women and the men sat in separate places in, uh, in the synagogues. When you consider that, you see that a role of women serving the women stands out as necessary. In fact, one of the church historians, Pliny, mentions in one of his writings two deaconesses who were martyred for the cause of Christ. So, what about this? It's interesting, and it surprised me really because I'll tell you, early on in my ministry, uh, I had not thought this through completely. But I found, years ago, I collect, I collect old Baptist works. This is the first book written by a Southern Baptist, R.B.C. Howell, written in 1846. The Southern Baptist Convention was formed in 1845, and he, the book's entitled The Deaconship. We've given these. They're, they're reprinted today. We've given these to our deacons when we set them aside here to serve. And it surprised me that R.B.C. Howell, in the seventh chapter of this little book, has a chapter entitled Deaconesses. Listen to this. Female assistants to the deacons, usually called deaconesses, existed in the primitive churches. They were ladies of approved character and piety, and their duty required them to minister to females under circumstances in which it would have been manifestly improper that the other sex should have been employed. Their services were regarded as very, of very great importance, if not entirely indispensable. Ecclesiastical historians, the early fathers, and other writers refer to them frequently and familiarly. And then he cites some biblical uh, examples. I won't read through all this. About, it's about a seven to ten pages on that topic. You might say, well, that's interesting that a Southern Baptist in 1846 was thinking that way, but this is 2015 for crying out loud. And I came across this, which might surprise you. Whether the women in view here are deacons, wives, or he's talking about 1 Timothy 3, 11, or a separate order of female deacons has been much disputed. The following points show that women in general, not necessarily deacons, wives, are in view in that passage. We had that on your ballot. And you'll remember that on verse where it said the, the items we numbered 7 through 10, we said, refer to the women who assist the deacons. It would include the deacons' wives, perhaps, in areas of service. And so, so that's referenced here. and gives some qualifications. We'll look at that. But listen to this. It says, first, the use of likewise in that passage argues strongly for seeing a third and distinct group here in addition to elders in the first part of 1 Timothy 3 and deacons. Second, there's no possessive pronoun or definite article connecting these women with deacons. 
It doesn't say their wives, though unfortunately some of our English translations say that. It's not, a, it's not the women of them or the wives of them. It's, a, it's not a possessive. Third, Paul gave no qualifications for elders' wives. And this is one of the things that R.B.C. Howell says. He says, if it was important, if these were the, the wives of the deacons, and then certainly, R.B.C. Howell says, certainly it's as, as important or more important that qualifications be given for the wives of the elders. And that's not, it's not there. Fourth, Paul did not use the word uh, deaconess because there was no such word in the Greek language. It only shows up in the masculine form, diakonos. So it was used of both men and women. Finally, the qualifications given in 1 Timothy 3, 11 parallel those of the male deacons. That's from the commentary on 1 Timothy by John MacArthur. So I want us to see just briefly here today, just kind of think about, really, really my desire is to bless our ladies because they're such a blessing to us. First, look at Phoebe as a model deaconess in Romans 16. Second, Paul addresses deaconesses as the women, 1 Timothy 3.11, we'll look at that. And then third, Bethel's deaconesses. First, Phoebe is commended as a model deacon, as Paul says in that passage in Romans 16, 1 and 2, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, a diaconon of the church at, at Sincrea, that you may welcome her. And so here's, look at his commendation here. I'm commending her, I'm putting her before you as someone worthy of your honor and respect. And I'm doing that so that, that this, in order that clause, the purpose clause, that you may welcome her, receive her in the Lord in a way Worthy of the saints. And help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a helper of many. And of myself as well. Paul wants the church to know that they'll be meeting someone named Phoebe who's coming who already labors faithfully in the church at Sincrea. And he wants them to know what he thinks of her. That she's a servant. She's been a blessing to many. Paul says, not only has she been a blessing to many, she's been a blessing to me. She's served me. She's helped me. She's supported my ministry. And so here's this woman. By the time Paul writes to uh, Rome, as we said to you last week in Colossians, when we looked at, at, at Colossians where he, in the opening verses, commends uh, and, and ce uh, uh, celebrates and recognizes at that church the, the pastors and the deacons that's, that's thinking in terms of, of role there. So in the same way he uses this of Phoebe. R.B.C. Howell develops in his little book some other passages that we won't take the time to unpack today. Second thing I want you to see is that Paul addresses deaconesses as the women in 1 Timothy 3.11. Look at that. In, and again, the ESV of this, the version which I use and I prefer, says in verse 11, their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. I want you to see some other, pass, some other translations. The New American Standard Bible, uh, the 1995 update, says this, of that same verse. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. So it uses the nominative form, the noun form of that. The New International Version, uh, in verse, same thing. In the same way, the women, and there you see it, the language is, is a, little, a little more descriptive, of a group of people, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers. And then the Revised Standard Version. The women likewise must be serious, no slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. And so it just shows you that translations, we need to be aware of the language, the Greek language there. And they bring to us this idea That Paul, when he wrote in 1 Timothy 3, 8 and following of the responsibilities of those servants in the church, 
spoke not only of the male servants, the deacons, but he spoke of a group called the women who needed to have certain qualifications. Let's look at these. And when you look at them, here's what I want you to know. They're not remarkable. To suggest that a woman be dignified does not mean that it's okay to be undignified if you're not, you don't think of yourself as a servant leader. It doesn't mean that you are free to slander if you don't think of yourself as a part of the group called the women. It doesn't mean that you can forget being sober-minded. It doesn't mean that you can be unfaithful. These are not remarkable qualifications. They are normative qualifications for any woman who names the name of Jesus Christ and is striving to be a follower of Christ. This word, dignified, he uses the same word in verse 8 to describe uh, deacons. They, may, they need to be serious about the gospel. You know, a merry heart does good like a medicine. That is true. But there are things, there ought to be a, a place where a person can be serious about the gospel. Not, not sad, uh, not, not sad and sober and frowning, but, but a serious mindedness. The gospel in their life and on their lip should reflect dignity. It is a wonderful message, a great reality. People should hold them in awe because of their devotion to Christ. Secondly, they're not to be malicious gossips. The word here is the word diabolos. It's, we, it's, a, it's a word that can mean the devil. Uh, it means slanderer. The devil is the slanderer. He's the liar. And so in, in, in Pilgrim's Progress, no, pardon me, in the Holy War by John Bunyan, this is the name designated to the devil, diabolos. Women are not to be malicious gossips. Their tongues should not breathe fire and spill poison, but rather should be organs of blessedness. A control of the tongue. They're also to be temperate, they're, or, they're sober. Uh, they're, they're not to let influences come into their lives that, that negatively influence their thinking, or, perhaps more importantly, their thinking be driven by emotion, but rather by the, by the reasonableness of the truth. And then faithful in all things, trustworthy. Not operating with ulterior motives. These are some descriptions that Paul gives to Timothy as he's challenged Timothy and Titus in their respective roles. Remember, we talked about these through the years where they are, they're called vicar apostolic. They are, they are representatives of the apostle in these churches where they serve. And Paul is telling Timothy in this place, in, in 1 Timothy, how to get this church at Ephesus in a biblical order. One writer has, has observed that when Paul went through one of his missionary journeys and then returned appointing leadership in these churches, some of these churches were not but just a few months old at best. And Paul believed that the grace of God in the gospel shown in, the, in a local visible church was so powerful that even a, a, a young church of people who had been saved out of pagan backgrounds would have people rising up showing these normative qualifications for Christians. And I thought about that. And I think about here. And I think about the precious women that God has given us here. Some are quieter than others, but you know what? When you get to know the women in this congregation, 
you get to experience something what Joshua was describing a while ago about this, this deep lake that has a calm. And you can drink from it. There's a lot of wisdom that comes from the women in this congregation. There's a ton of servant heart that is expressed by the women in this congregation. You know what, what I've learned through the years is a, a man might say to me, that's not my responsibility, but I have seldom heard in this place a woman shrug something off like that. She, she's constructed by God. Think about this. When God made our first father, Adam, and taught Adam that it was not good that he be alone, but that, that what he needed was a helper suitable to him, and that he could depend on God to provide that. And God took Eve out of the rib of Adam and gave her to him. And we see the development, the biblical development of role relationships. The woman is to be submissive to her husband. We've talked about these things, but, but that is not a, if a husband, <laughs> I've told you this before, if a husband says, submit to me, then not whatever you're getting out of that is not what the Bible's talking about. It's the voluntarily, voluntarily placing oneself under the leadership of another to, to enhance uh, in the home, particularly to enhance that man's effectiveness. In the church, however, that servant heart, that, that training ground, you see women, women who bear children experience something that a man will never experience. Life in the womb, bringing forth another life, having to care for some, a baby who is totally helpless, totally at the mercy of a, of a mom. And it's that, that sacrificial life of a mom that uniquely equips her and prepares her as a servant in the body of Jesus Christ. Sometimes men have to be trained in this because men may rise to, to positions of leadership in their, in their livelihood where they make all the decisions, they call all the shots, and, and they have to be trained and taught to, to, to come under. But God uniquely prepares women and gifts them and equips them so that they, they bring that to the church. I'm thankful to God that we have here male leadership. Thank God for our, our leaders. And I've known many churches where there was not such, and, but the church moved on. How? Because the, of that beating heart, that pulse that God places into the life of a woman. And so when a church has capable male leadership, which we have here, and capable, capable female leadership, the women playing that role, what a blessing it is. And I, I want to just commend you today. I want to encourage you today. What you are. You, you are. Many of you fit this title, this term deaconess. You serve. In fact, you are, you are a suitable helper with a servant heart. That's, that's the model. And we are blessed for it. And we are strengthened for it. And I want to challenge you today because we're in, we're in troubled waters in our culture. The feminist movement took us from people, women wanting to be equal, which the Bible had already accomplished, by the way, <laughs> to wanting not to be different. And now with the whole 
loss of, of gender distinction. Your daughters will be raised and your grandchildren will be raised in a culture that says to identify male or female is sexist. And I'm thankful and I thank God every day that in this setting, in this climate, whatever happens around us in the culture, that little boys and little girls can be brought into this and be raised and taught the biblical basis for role, relationships, and distinctions. And celebrate the strengths that are unique in manhood and womanhood. And know that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ requires, demands, deacons and deaconesses in order to be healthy. R.B.C. Howell says as much in 1846 when he says, this is, this is the way it is in all healthy churches. And some people go take this farther. I would encourage you to read R.B.C. Howell if you get an opportunity and if you want, I'll, I'll Xerox this chapter for you where he can, his conclusions he draws and I think he's right on, on the mark. That while there is no mention in setting apart the women like the men are set apart for service, that they're, the fact is they are there and they serve as assistants to the deacon. So, yes, it can be a, a deacon's wife. She, she as one of our women would have the heart of a servant. That's, so it's not wrong. But to recognize that it may, it may go beyond that. It may be that there are widows who, who, who have this pulse and this beating heart and who have this, this history to be capable, suitable helpers with servant hearts. As we move together in the days to come, I want us to celebrate these things more, obviously. I want us to think more biblically about this and recognize it, observe it, and value it that Bethel Baptist Church, since its founding, has had deacons and deaconesses. R.B.C. Howell says where, where, the, where the name is not given or assigned, there is the functional equivalent of it, and I agree with him. And on this Mother's Day, when you may wonder, the devil may lie to you and wonder, what is your value? Well, let's make no mistake about it. You are uniquely equipped and uniquely qualified to develop attitudes and attributes that reflect this term, deaconess. And sometimes you may get weighted down as a mom or a grandma or a great-grandma and even, even have the devil plague you and challenge you and what have you accomplished and what's it been worth and what is your worth to remember that God in his goodness puts you in the crucible of womanhood and in a very real sense brought you to adulthood equipped as a servant heart. Whereas men often have to learn that. To develop it. To consciously fight against things about us so that we will be servants of the Most High God. Servants of one another. Servants of Christ. Servants in the congregation and serving the world. Celebrate today that while, while we as men have to learn how to serve the world, that God has so equipped, equipped you and built you that it flows out of your being who you are. And when that is harnessed by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, it is a powerful weapon for the gospel and against the enemy of our souls. It was so in my home. My mother served. She served in a very difficult situation. In 
And she raised six children in a difficult situation. Not only with a husband who was not a leader, but with a husband who often, as a, as a church member, as a Sunday school teacher, as a deacon, was antagonistic to her leadership. Counterproductive to what she was trying to accomplish in raising her three sons and three daughters in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And it was her servant heart in our home, in our church, and in our community that impacted lives. And I believe God honored in the salvation of all of the children and seeing them come to adulthood as all of them serving in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was her legacy, part of it. And that is yours here. I'm convinced for many of you that is yours. And don't give up. Don't get weary. Don't believe the lies of the enemy of our soul. You, dear women, are precious in God's sight. In your homes and in this church, you are precious in God's sight. And I have no doubt that you are impacting your world around you in ways that may not be made known until we get to heaven. And you young women, you little girls growing up, look at your mom. Study her. Listen to her. Obey her because in this place, there are many daughters of Jerusalem who are wonderful examples of what it means to be a deaconess. Long to be like her. You young men, look at your mom and learn to sing that little song in the back of your head, I want a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. And your parents, as you raise these children, recognize in them, particularly in the little girls, the powerful, the powerful future that can be there if we nurture them and cultivate them. And the blessing we will give to the church and to the world if we think these ways, that really and truly every man Every woman in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should be, quote, qualified to be a deacon or a deaconess. And that God will raise some up as the superlative examples, not as the, not as the exceptions to the rule, but the superlative examples because the rule is so prominent and dominant in a congregation. How does this happen? It, Joshua said it earlier. It only happens with a true relationship with Jesus Christ. Somewhere along the way, and I, said, I believe the earlier the better, somewhere along the way, Jesus Christ becomes the Lord and Savior. He becomes, he becomes your Savior and your servant, and he, and he fills you with His Spirit and provokes in you the desire to learn and cultivate servanthood. That's how this happens. We read it in Mark 10. We'll see it when we get to Mark 10 in our study through Mark. The rulers... The world's people rule it over them. And, and I didn't read it with the emphasis that I'll give it when we study it. Our texts say it should not be so with you. No, no, when Jesus said this in Mark, he said, Not so you. Because his kingdom is at a polar opposite with the kingdoms of this world. He would have us serve. So thank you, godly women, for the example you set in serving the Lord Jesus Christ, serving in your homes, serving in this church, serving one another, and I have no doubt serving the world around you in ways that I do not know. Thank you for that. You bless us. You encourage us. You honor us. Sometimes you sustain us. That's what Paul's saying here. I commend to you, Phoebe, she has helped many. Paul says, she's helped me. 
Let's pray together.